Jillian here at the Water Conservation Garden in East San Diego. Our trails are open and the crepe myrtles are blooming. And today we're bringing you this special online program that is sponsored by our friends at Integrated Regional Water Management with our favorite San Diego water harvesting professional, Brooke Sarson of Catching Water H2O. Now the trickiest part about inviting Brooke to teach is actually selecting which aspect of water harvesting to have her cover. Um, she knows the ins and outs of gray water and rainwater in hundreds of scenarios. Uh, her and her family live sustainably. And Brooke is actually advocating to make it easier for water harvesting to happen in our region in an equitable way. So we really admire the work that she's doing in the community and her professional experience. So again, narrowing in on this hour topic, we asked Brooke to help guide you all through the question, is water harvesting for me? But we're not stopping here. The Water Conservation Garden is also offering consultations, which are video phone calls with Brooke, to give you personalized guidance and advice for setting up and integrating water harvesting in your landscapes. Uh, we'd love to see you all have more water harvesting in your lives. And um, so stick around till the end of the workshop. We've got some great question and answers that are gonna happen. She's also gonna do a demonstration property which is something similar to what you would see in a consultation. And many of you have participated prior to this workshop, helping us to survey and figure out what our base of knowledge is and what it is we'd like to know moving forward. So thank you for your attendance now. Thank you for your care and concern in conservation. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Brooke. Again, our friends at IRWM are making this program happen. We hope you all enjoy. Um, it's always a pleasure to te teach with the Water Conservation Garden. Um, you know, I think, I think most people in San Diego are, you know, on board with water conservation, but I think where we have a gap is what that really looks like. Um, how, you know, how our water habits, you know, are impacting our region. Um, it's not just about rain or no rain. It's not just about, you know, planting a couple of drought tolerant plants. We really, I think what I notice, um, and, you know, maybe as we go through this presentation, um, you guys will become a little bit more aware also, but I noticed that most people really don't have a lot of connection to how much water they use, like what, you know, that extra minute in a shower means, or, you know, what, um, you know, just what a lot of their habits relate to as far as like the bigger water picture. Um, I think it's important to know as a general baseline that 80% of our water comes from outside of this region. It comes from hundreds of miles away. It impacts other ecosystems that we're not related to, connected to. So we don't, you know, it doesn't uh, impact us how those ecosystems are, are impacted. Um, what we're working on with Catching H2O and through, you know, partnerships with UCSD and the Integrated Regional Watershed Management Group are ways of localizing our water. And decentralized water systems, like the ones we're going to talk about today, can actually have a huge impact on creating and valuing local water. So I'm, I'm so glad you all are here today with me. Um, and let's ask the question, is water harvesting for me? I did notice that many of you um, have rain barrels, which is a good start, but hopefully you'll understand a little bit more about, again, like how much water is that and how much water do I actually need or want? Um, and how much water can I actually generate on my site? Um, so getting to the heart of it is what is your goal? Um, you know, people have all different kinds of goals. I looked at your responses to the survey and you guys have all different kinds of goals. Some of you want to, you know, manage a certain aspect of your yard. Other people have a more larger activism picture in mind. Um, and it really spans the gamut. But at the heart of it, if you, if you pay attention to the, the bottom line, which is how much water do I need and how much water am I, you know, generating, and where, you know, what water is actually available, um, you can solve 
a lot of problems, a lot more than the ones that you just want to, you know, you might have in your mind. So there's lots of reasons to implement these systems, but really getting in tune with your goal will help you match what system is best for you, like what kinds of pr practices um, and, um, you know, what kinds of strategies will work for you. So we get calls about people who want to prolong the life of their septic system or not have to like fix it or alter it. We get calls, you know, from people who are like, my foundation is getting flooded out. Um, I don't want to pay $10,000 for a um, French drain. I'd rather pay $10,000 to keep the water and use it as a resource, you know? Um, so there's lots of reasons to get involved in these practices. Um, so keep that in mind as, as we're going along. Really getting in tune with um, what, our, what, what our region is about as far as water goes might help you feel more empowered. Um, in San Diego, we're using 140 gallons per person per day. Remember, most of that's exported water. And the largest amount of our water resources are in residential applications. And of those, you know, more than 50% of our water used in residential applications, 75% of that is on outdoor irrigation. So it's not just, you know, fun or, you know, a drop in the bucket to shift, you know, your reality around what your outdoor watering needs are. Um, we can make significant impact. I did some like sometimes I like playing around with some funny numbers and was using some of those numbers you saw before and realized that if, if we reduce our landscape irrigation by just 50%, so that's our outdoor residential water use, we would need to import 25% less water. I mean, that means we're, we're generating local water, we're relying on local water resources. And, and this image is a great example of going to zero outdoor water use um, by contouring the landscape, routing gray water in, capturing rainwater and using that during the summer months and planting appropriate plantings. And it doesn't have to be strictly drought tolerant. This one has fruit trees because of the gray water. So you can actually create like a holistic landscape, something that you love, something that's beautiful, something that's useful. Um, and use no water because no, when I say no water, I mean no exported water or imported water. You're using water that you're generating on site from either gray water or rainwater. So there's a lot of potential here and we do this all the time. And, and these numbers are just for 50%. Imagine if we went lower, imagine if we created a community of landscapes that was based on our local water resources. We, you know, we would be we would be flying with no need for exported water. We'd have resilience as you know um, things shift over the coming years. So some of the confusion about water conservation and saving water is like I need to not use. Sorry about that. Sorry, um, my slides sometimes do that. I'm not the pro at animations, and I don't know why they do that. Anyway, the point is is that. Um, um, you can plant nothing, but then you'll have other issues. You have sun, hot sun reflecting on your house. We're not creating healthy soil, which we all know, or some of us know is, is a good way to offset um, global or greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then you don't create habitat for pollinators. This is the same yard. It's using the same amount of imported water, zero. So we've got gray water from the washing machine going into this yard every, you know, every week. We've got rainwater kind of building up in the rainy season in the soil, and then we planted appropriate plantings. Now these trees are gonna provide shade for this house so they don't have to turn the AC on as much. There's hummingbirds and bees and butterflies like all over the place. And this is the kind, these are the kinds of things we would like to see, and it really doesn't take much. Um, you know, just other examples of how these properties come to fruition very quickly. This is less than a year. It's just laundry gray water and some rainwater from a nearby rainwater tank. No other management. You can see the landscape just filled right in. Um, you know, when we're working with water harvesting, we're not just picking something off the shelf and saying, now I've done something green, you know, I'm sustainable now. 
it's really getting back to the bottom of the design process and, and creating an integrated solution. So this landscape was actually started from scratch based on the water availability. And Brad Lancaster, who's one of my personal heroes and I have information about him in the back, has eight water harvesting principles. And, the, and one of his is plant the water first. So really understanding what water you have to begin with and then planting around. I mean, this is a typical backyard in normal heights. I mean, but knowing how much rainwater we could catch, how much room she was willing to give up to store that, um, how much gray water was available, we were able to just plant in abundance. All of the plants you see in this picture are watered with uh, gray water, which you can't see any of that. And the rainwater tanks go to a productive veggie bed, uh, veggie garden. So. There's a lot you can do. Here's another example of this was all lawn, and now the rent, the front yard is zero scapes, no water needed in there except for the you know annual rainwater flushes, and then the backyard is um, a combination of uh, some earthworks, which we'll go more into, and um, uh, pr appropriate plantings. This is just purely rainwater. All the rainwater from the roof for all these houses in PB just washes down the street, creates flooding. Meanwhile, you have these huge nature strips that just are mostly lawn, they're mostly mounded. Water just pours off of everywhere in the rain. So taking you know, our knowledge, we created indentations for water to soak into and routed all the water from the nearby roof under the sidewalk and into these basins and then planted a, a strictly native landscape. And you can see the progression and now it's just this beautiful area um, and he's really keeping all of his roof water out of the storm drain during rain events, which means you don't have these big flushes of polluted water out in the um, ocean. So there's lots of different kinds of things going on in these these snapshots, um, and they all involve using the water that you have um, to create um, solutions. So a lot of you, um, I, I would say it was about 50-50 with your surveys. Some of you, you know, mo like half of you wanted better rainwater solutions and half of you were interested in gray water solutions. Um, most of you, like I said, have rain barrels. I think I would, I would argue or I would suggest that most of you are probably like, ah, oh, my rain barrel, it just doesn't work that great. It fills up so fast, I'm ready to take the next step, um, which is great. So some, uh, you know, some of your next questions might be, well, uh, there's a lot of water coming off my roof, but how much? You know, is this water okay for my veggies? Is this water okay for my fruit trees? Should I, can I use this water for my lawn? Um, you know, lots of different kinds of questions I get, and this is where we start to assess how you, um, not only what you wanna grow in your yard, what your patterns are. Do you like to hand water? Are you the kind of person that is never gonna go out there and use that tank water um, unless it's an automatic system? Um, are you the kind of person that's going to do good maintenance on your system or you really need it to be maintenance free, um, even if the maintenance is simple? Um, these are the kinds of questions that you'll want to answer in order to arrive at what system is right for you. Um, first of all, know, understanding how much water is actually coming off your roof. So um, a little bit later, I'll show you a, a way that you can um, Imagine this for yourself, but a thousand square feet will generate 600 gallons in only one inch of rain. Uh, in San Diego, it rains about 10 inches and then you move inland and about 12, 14 inches a year. Um, so there's thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons coming off your roof, which is why your 55 gallon drum just doesn't cut the mustard. Um, on the other hand, you know, how much does my yard need? I mean, the way that I kind of start, the simplest metric I can use is that a, a fruit tree in our region uses about 25 gallons a week. So your rain barrel will take care of your fruit tree for about two weeks, one fruit tree. So if you get this 500 gallon tank instead, which is you know 10 times the amount of water and about the same amount of space, um, you know you can water that tree for 10 times as long, or you can water 10 trees you know, for that length of time. Um, 
you know, it's great for growing veggies, the water quality when you filter it. I mean, I'm, most of you who have rain barrels probably are like, that water's so gross. You know, I wouldn't, you know, maybe, but usually the water's not filtered that well. We always put some simple filters on our tanks um, and it's important that you do that. And the water's very clean. You can keep it for many, many months and use it to water your veggies. Um, everybody's doing it. I mean, I think that's a, you know, there's a misconception of like, oh, it's so ugly and people, my neighbors won't like it and all of these kinds of things. But we've literally installed, I think, I think it's something like uh, a million gallons of water in this county alone. Um, you know, over 500 installations and just, you know, all different sizes and shapes, but you know, it, it is happening. Some people hide them in their backyard. Some people put them in their front yard. Um, it's really just personal preference and there's way, cool ways to hide them. Um, a wet system isn't uh, something that many people don't really know that much about, but it's a good way to place a tank further out in your yard. If you have like a corner in your yard where you can fit a larger container, can actually bring the pipes underground and out to that tank with no pump as long as the top of the tank is lower than the glued pipe under the, the uh, leaf filter. Um, and so we do that a lot. And then you can kind of hide the tanks in lots of different ways. People build fences and, and cubbies like they do for their air conditioners or their trash cans. Um, you can hide them in the shadows, plant things around them that you know cover them up very quickly. Um, passion fruit can cover a, a rainwater tank in like six months. It's awesome. Um, but you know, a rainwater tank is a thing and it costs money and you know, it has maintenance. And um, at the end of the day, getting the water into the landscape to build moisture layers up in the soil is the easiest way to capture water. And, and I know you're saying, well, if it's raining, I don't really need the water. But what's going on is when it stops raining, most of the water in a typical event that is like compacted soil, like a lawn or something, most of it runs off. A little bit soaks in, but you know, within a few days, maybe a week at most, you have to start watering all over again. If you create contours in the landscape that can catch and hold the flow of water, you know, your, your roof it may be as big as your yard, which means if you can get all of that water into your yard, your yard is getting twice as much rainfall collected in the soil as it would in, you know, a typical year, which means that you can plant things that need a little bit more water. Or maybe you don't need to water for a month or six weeks or two months after it stops raining because you've just put so much water in the soil and you've got this mulch, um, you know, holding it all in, in place and preventing it from evaporating. Um, so this is really a critical element. If you don't want to buy a thingy, you don't want to have a thing in your yard and you don't want to have a maintenance uh, issue, then just creating a contours for the water to soak into and then you know there's a whole book on this there's plenty of online resources you know um, I do find that people who are excited about this but haven't really studied tend to undersize earthworks I think we all think oh this is big enough I remember I you know working with Brad in this wash Brad Lancaster and you know we made this giant berm like you know, perpendicular to the slope so that the water would stop and soak in. And we were so stoked and we're like, how do you like this, Brad? And he's like, bigger, you know? And it was a real wake up call to me because, you know, ever since then, I just have to keep remembering, you know, this is gonna be a lot of water and there's ways to calculate that. So this is kind of what it looks like after a rain. So a typical backyard in like Scripps Ranch with lawn, lots of drains so that you're not flooding the house and so all the water can go out to the storm drain and you lose it and then you need to add more water to your lawn. Um, you know, this is a different way of doing things where you make sure that the water is not pooling at your foundation, you create places for it to flow to. And then after this picture was taken, so this, it rained at this point, and then after this picture was taken, everything got filled in with mulch. So it looks like just a mulchy backyard with lots of plants, but underneath the, the layers, there's all this work going on and water just, you know, soaking in and soaking in. These are just some simple, like, you know, little slope areas where you just add a little berm and put some 
um, mulch in and you know instead of the water kind of running down and creating erosive rivulets you're creating a resource for those trees that's that's rainwater in a nutshell i mean um we'll go into a little more site specific detail um in a little bit but um is there any questions specifically on any of that jillian in the chat or I haven't seen any questions come in yet. I think we're all just engaged in listening. But if you do have a question about what Brooke just covered, you can enter it into the chat. And Brooke, I'll share with you the poll about our water usage. Awesome, thanks. So, you know, I think rainwater sometimes seems more obvious. I, different people have, you know, different ideas and I come across both of them. Some people, for, uh, rainwater is the most obvious solution. Um, other people, gray water is a more obvious solution. They don't think it rains enough. And so they're not thinking about that. But gray water is important also because, you know, we're already importing all of this water and then we're using it once, you know, in our showers and our laundry, and then we're sending it out to wastewater treatment facilities that then shoot it out into the ocean. So putting a lot of energy and impact into our environment and, you know, what we pay taxes for and all of that. If everybody disconnected just their washing machine from, you know, main, the sewer system, you know, we, we wouldn't need to keep growing our wastewater treatment facilities. Um, and then the other issue is that, you know, your, your laundry gray water, it has a minimal amount of pollutants in it compared to like poop from the toilet, you know? And yet then we're mixing it in and it has to be cleaned and managed to a extreme degree in order for it to then be released out into, um, you know, the environment. But you can actually release your gray water right out into your own backyard, you know, with no filtration and all of those quote unquote pollutants that are in the gray water provide nutrients for the microbes in the soil that then turn it into fertilizer that make your plants grow better. It's, it's crazy, um, but not crazy. I mean, this is what people have been doing for millennia before we got sewer systems, you know? Um, and when we got into urban centers, um, it, 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 we didn't continue our, our knowledge, our lineage of understanding how to use water in our environments. And it became a big management issue. So then we put it on the municipal systems to manage it. Um, so we're just trying to bring it back to, you know, a more simple way of understanding water. And then we can have more respect for water and then, um, you know, we will have better water systems. Um, the great thing is in California, you don't need a permit to put in a laundry gray water system. This is probably the simplest system for anybody to put in, um, whether you have a slab or a crawl space, or you don't know if you have a slab or a crawl space. Um, if your washing machine is located in your garage, near your garage, or near an outside, on an outside wall somewhere, um, it's quite easy to just reroute it outside because there's a pump on the washing machine that pumps the water up to the drain and then it turns into a drain. Um, so this is where the nexus between um, plumbing and um, gray water comes to kind of a misunderstanding. Your typical plumber wants to drain that water out, you know, to the sewer, or if he wants to put it in your house, he wants to drain it with gravity. But we have, there is a pump on the washing machine that's underutilized. And so um, Art Ludwig developed this laundry to landscape gray water system, which capitalizes on that pump, keeping it in a smaller di diameter tube that can um, basically run it out to your landscape um, you know, even up to 50, 60 feet out, not with gravity, so you don't have to do a lot of crazy trenching and dis distribute it to many places. Shower water is going to be a lot more water to distribute, but it's a little bit more complicated to how to do that. Um, and keeping it simple is just requires a little bit more skill in how you dig your basins and uh, position your planting. So the nuance is not putting um, the energy into a thing that you buy to, to put in, but the energy to really understand how your environment engages with water and plants and your, and your own self. Um, 
so I think in our, unfortunately in our society these days, we've put all of the, the burden on the things that we can buy to make our lives easier. But this is one instance where, you know, there are easy solutions. We just, um, we, we've lost the knowledge. So, um, oops. So can every, is everybody looking at the poll or is it just me? Jillian. Everyone's looking and you can also minimize it on your screen on the top right if you don't want to look at the poll. Okay, well, we'll just look at it here for a minute. Um, I was, as I was saying, gray water is from your showers on your washing machine. It's not from your kitchen sink or your toilet, according to the state of California. Um, so this is the poll that you guys all filled out. So how many showers, you know, I think this is just, I'm, you, it's good for you guys to see. I think most people, you know, I walk in and I'll get answers of like, well, my showers aren't, you know, they're not long. And then other people who are like, well, she takes a long shower, but you don't know relative to anybody. You know, some people think 10 minutes is a long shower. Some people think five minutes is a long shower. I think 20 minutes is a really long shower. But um, so it looks like, you know, depending on how many people you have in your house and like if they're athletic or whatever, um, two showers is about average, you know. Um, how long are your showers? Okay. You know, this is this is pretty, you know, standard. I would say these are the general answers that I get. Um, and then what type of washing machine do you, you have? Okay, so a front load washer is gonna be the most efficient washer. It's gonna be, especially if it's a newer model, between, you know, to up to 10 years ago, is probably only using about 10 gallons a load. Make note of that, everybody. Front load washer, 10 gallons a load. Um, the other half of you, or a little bit more than half, have a top load washer. Now, if you have an old top load washer, um, that could be using about 50 gallons a load, which doesn't mean you have to get rid of it. It might mean you just need to plant more trees. Um, but if you have a top load washer and it's newer, it's still using a bit of water. You've got about 25 gallons a load. Some people swear by the top load washers. They say the front load washers just don't do the job or they mold or whatever. So that's fine. Um, it just might mean you have more water available to your plants. So um, how many loads per week? So I'm seeing two is like an average. So if you had two loads a week with a front load washer, you'd be producing about 20 gallons a week. 10, 10 gallons a load, two, ga two loads a week, 20 gallons a week. If you're doing a top load washer, that would be more like 50 gallons a week. So with a front load washer, you could water one tree. And with a top load washer, you could water two trees. That's just like my oversimplified way of thinking about it. Um, and what it boils down to, uh, whether or not this is uh, useful for you, is um, how much does it make sense for you to spend on these systems if all you're going to get out of it is one fruit tree? Um, so... Yeah, I mean, people have some drip, some people want to update their irrigation, um, some people are hand watering right now. Um, it looks like it, you guys are doing a wide mix of things. So, you know, if you love hand watering, if you like being out there in the garden, you know, having a rainwater tank with some rainwater, it's not that different. Um, a gray water system is going to take some of your plants offline so that you don't need to manage that anymore. Um, but you do have to make sure that you're, you're not over irrigating by sending the gray water out, investing in that system and also having it irrigated. So you have to be able to shut off zones. So I try and like stack the gray water system on existing zones or we alter the zones so that you can shut some things off. It is a good idea to have, um, irrigation, uh, the ability to turn the irrigation system on in case you go out of town. So I'm going to shut the pole off, continue on gray water, and um, the, we kind of went over this roughly, um, the, the water budget, which is understanding how much water you're actually producing. So this is kind of where you start to understand, does this make sense for me? You know, if I'm going to spend you know, $500 on a laundry gray water system that, you know, maybe I buy all the parts myself and, and somebody helps me install for, you know, a couple hours. 
um, and I can water one fruit tree all year, or actually, you know, it'd be a lot less than that for one fruit tree. But, you know, we'll just say, say you can water four fruit trees all year round, you know, and an installed system is like 1200 bucks. You know, are those four fruit trees worth it? If you're looking at dollar per gallon, you know, over the course of a year, maybe you get, you know, like a two to five year return on investment. You know, I, that's just a wild guess. Um, if you're looking at a shower system, you're producing a lot more water, but it might it might be a more expensive install. So it might be more like twenty, you know, two thousand uh, dollars to install that. But you're probably producing four or more times the amount of water. Um, so that might be more worth it. I think most people think, oh, shower water is too complicated or something. But man, and sometimes it is. You get into a pump system and you're looking at 3,500 gallons. Well, if you have an extensive landscape and you're putting in a pump system that will distribute the water um, very efficiently, um, I would bet you'd make that return on investment, you know, in a few short years. This is where you kind of go in and you look at your water bill and you see how much water costs per gallon. And one thing that we tend to look at if people are looking at quote unquote saving money on their water bill is if you're in the upper tiers because of your landscape watering use, we look at how we can most effectively use these opportunities to get you out of an upper tier so that your um, water rates over the years will remain more stable. Because you know that the higher tiers are gonna probably go up in price more quickly over you know, the, the years, especially as the ecosystems remember from hundreds of miles away are more and more impacted. Um, so if you have a shower, um, you're going to want to remember this because we're going to go over an interesting example later. Um, your shower heads are typically 2 to 2.5 gallons per minute. That's like the low water use. You can get as low as 1.5 gallon per minute, um, and I'll talk about that. Um, so if you take one 10 minute shower, you're looking at 20 gallons a day to so 140 gallons a week. So, I mean, that's seven times more than most of you are producing out of your washing machine. Brooke, we have a question from Rebecca about shower gray water. Do you have to filter it? You don't. It's, um, you know, also lightly, I'll say, I don't want to use the word contaminated, but, you know, it has soap and hair, dead skin, pee, maybe. Um, you know, all of that stuff ends up being nutrients for the microbes. Um, in the olden days, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, when people were starting to really um, kind of promote gray water, they were putting, trying to come up with all kinds of wood chip filters and things. Over and over again, you know, people don't maintain it, they forget about it, it clogs, it becomes a really toxic, disgusting mess. Better to let it go out into mulch basins, just flood irrigate under mulch um, and go right into the root zones of the trees. That, that's the much better system. We do some filtration when we use a pump. So we have a surge tank and there's a very simple filter on the inlet of the system on the surge tank. And then that way it doesn't um, make your pump wear out, but that's, that's it. Um, so understanding where you can use gray water is also important. Most people are, or not most, but a lot of people are like, well, I want to keep my lawn and I figure my laundry machine's right here. I can just do that. First of all, get a reality check about how much water your plants need. A 500 square foot lawn uses over 10,000 gallons a year. You're not producing 10,000 gallons from your washing machine. You probably aren't even producing 10,000 gallons from your shower. Not only that, but there is bacteria in gray water. And the bacteria, if you or your pets or your kids or even native animals come into contact with it, can, you know, be detrimental. So we don't surface flow gray water. We always put it into these basins and do subsurface irrigation. That is, that is the rules. That is the law. Um, so no surface watering of lawns. You don't just let it run down a slope into the canyon. Um, you really have to make sure it's soaking in. When it soaks in, the soil is filtering it and keeping the bacteria and accumulated salts and stuff like that away from, you know, the roots of trees or the surface of the, um, of the landscape. 
So um, the things that you want to water with gray water are things where it's just hitting the roots and you're not eating anything that's going to come into splashed droplet, uh, into contact with splashed droplet. So you can water things like tomatoes, passion fruit, you know, pumpkins, as long as they're not sitting in the basins. Um, but fruit trees are great, any kind of ornamentals. Uh, some natives don't prefer it because it is higher in salt, so those salts tend to accumulate in our heavy clay soils and they will dehydrate and um, basically poison some very sensitive natives. So just you can do research on that. There's lots of resources in the university systems. They've sort of like learned what kind of drought tolerant plants work on the sides of freeways with recycled water, which is not great water, but it's uh, you know, recycled municipal water that still has a lot of salts. So those are good resources for what would work with gray water. Also, by putting, you know, routing your downspout, rainwater downspouts or overflows into the areas where there's gray water, it'll clean the soil um, from those salt buildups and uh, make the water better for the plants going forward. Um, simple laundry systems, like I said, there's a pump on the washing machine. You always put a three-way valve in so that you can redirect the water um, back to the sewer if you need to, or the septic. Like you're going to run bleach, or it's raining really hard outside and everything's flooded, and you just don't want to, um, you know, have water overflowing into the storm drains or into the canyon areas. Um, a good soap that doesn't have a lot of sodium. Um, and then basins, the areas that can collect the pooling water. Um, you know, this was a family, we put this in as a workshop. They probably ended up paying like 500 bucks for the workshop and the parts. And then two years later, they had eight very productive fruit trees just from their laundry water. This is kind of like how the contours can look where you kind of dig around and make sure there's lots of places for the water to spread out um, near the root systems of the trees and then you start covering it up. In there too. And um, here's another example of, um, let me know if it stops working. I said the connection's unstable. This is another example of a, a basin we put in the front yard in Oceanside. You can see the contours there. You can see the laundry to landscape pipes. You can see the rainwater, the big white rainwater pipes in there. Afterwards, you don't see any of that. You see some green lids and they put the plants in next to the basin and they don't need to do any watering here. And it doesn't look like you just excavated a big hole. Um, shower water is different because you have to actually get under the pipes of the shower or bath, which means, um, you know, underground. So if you have a slab, this is probably not a good idea for you unless you're doing a remodel. Um, otherwise, uh, if you have a crawl space, this is an option. Um, a branch drain system is just flood irrigation. It's just putting some fittings at these junctures to split the water to a couple different places. There's a lot of creative ways to move this water with gravity, but um, you know, it's tricky. This is a slab and we got to this just in time when the plumber could um, drill out through the, um, through the edge when he had the bathtub out and get the shower water out and then reconnect it to the sewer system outside of the slab so that we had, um, we had access to this water in the landscape. Um, here's another example of a branch drain system. There's a nice slope here, so just creating those contours that will stop the flow of water down the hill and planting stuff that just loves water, like bananas. And here's a, you know, an example of what it looks like when you set up a pump system. There's, you know, a surge tank, there's a pump in there, there's a filter to clean, there's a tank alert if the um, pump's not working, and then that's your little maintenance zone, and then the water from there goes out into the landscape. Um, you know, it doesn't really take long for some of these systems to fill in. You know, this is like, it's probably two years. It went from a lawn to this productive area with like 14 fruit trees and a bunch of herbs in just a like small yard in Talmadge. And it was just like this underground reservoir basically of water that you never saw and you could just enjoy the yard. So that is um, the end of the presentation. Um, but I, I'm gonna go over some um, useful resources for you. 
I will put this back up at the end. So don't worry if I, I'm gonna leave this screen right now, if I can figure this out. Um, and I'm gonna go to Google Earth. Remember, I'll, I'll go back to that. Um, you, are you not, you're not seeing Google Earth right now. All right. I can't hear you. Are you seeing Google Earth now? Okay, great. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of this. So this is um, Kath and Mark's house in Lakeside. Um, and this is Google Earth. This is a great tool for you guys. Um, and this is how I do my phone consultations or even when I'm uh, analyzing a property after I've already been there. Um, you know, the great thing about being on site is I can see the topography a little bit better, but um, this has a measurement tool that's very helpful. Um, do you guys see the measurement tool up here in the yes. corner? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go over here and click on this uh, measuring tape and I'm just gonna, um, oops, it just disappeared. I'm just gonna click on the corners of the roof line. I mean, I, I don't know if any of you guys have seen this before. So maybe it's review for some of you, but it's a great, a great tool if you haven't seen it. I think this, when I did the 3D, I think it comes out like this or something. Um, and we'll, we'll do the 3D. So when I walked all the way around the roof, um, I can see that it has an area of 3,322 square feet. So the homeowner put 1,900 square feet. Uh, that's probably what it was sold as, but it has a garage and it has an overhang and it you know, has patio or whatever. Um, so this is the actual square footage. Now, um, can I, can you see the calculator or no? No. I don't see the calculator. I'm gonna, um, so I'm gonna go to the calculator and what, remember it was like 3,322 square feet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type in 3,322 square feet and I'm gonna multiply that by 7.48, which is the gallons per cubic foot. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna divide by 12 because what we wanna actually find out is gallons per inch. So that 2070 is how many gallons of water are falling off of this roof every time it rains an inch, 2070. Okay, so 55 gallon drum is really not gonna do anything there. Um, and now I'm gonna multiply that times 12, assuming that Lakeside gets 12 inches of rain a year. They might be more like 14, but I'm just gonna do 12. So now we're back at 24,848 gallons every year that are coming off of this roof. I think if you did a match to the landscape, you might even notice that this is more water than the landscape needs if it's not lawn. Um, so that's a good thing for you to know. Um, how do you want to use this water? Maybe you don't, you know, some people are like, I want to store all of it. Maybe you don't need to. Maybe, uh, you know, you just want enough for your veggie garden and a 500 or a thousand gallon tank will do fine. Um, and then the rest of, and then you can kind of get clever about which roof line you want to pick up and which ones you don't want to pick up. You don't need to spend a lot of money on gutters if all you want to do is catch a small portion of rain. Um, you know, the next part of this, okay, so I'm going to um, go back to Google Earth. Um, are you guys looking at Google Earth now? Yes. Okay, so I'm just going to do like a 3D, 3D kind of like drive by. Um, so this kind of helps me see where the roof lines are um, and the topography of the landscape. And I'm noticing the driveway. Are Mark and Kath on the call? Kath is here. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Kath. Hi. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Um, so one of my questions is, let's see. I'm going to start with um, where do you have any, uh, do you have gutters? Yes, we do. Okay. Do you have drains on your property? Not that I know of. 
So the, the downspouts just kind of go out, but they don't like go into an underground pipe. Um, that's correct. We have one going into that um, woefully inadequate 50 gallon rain barrel and the rest, yeah, just soaks into the, or, or goes into our, we have a little bit of landscaping, not a lot. As you can see, our front yard is mostly concrete until you hit the slope, the backyard, um, currently is pretty much as you see it kind of just dirt because we haven't yet done anything to the backyard and then um, you can see it's very sloped we have a, a pretty steep slope down the back and we have one level that's terraced off with three trees uh down in the back below these rocks yes okay and can i ask you where's your washing machine is it in your garage over it's here in the garage yeah and so the garage as you're looking at the picture it is the left set side of the picture right near um sort of to the left of the longer row of solar panels that you see yep yep okay so some of the other things that i've uh, i that i think about when i look at this property um one thing i think about is wow this driveway is probably shedding a lot of water all by itself it's almost as big as the house you can see that depending on how it's sloped you know you might be either losing this resource if it's all going down the driveway, you know, down here. Can you guys see my arrow or no? Yeah. Um, yeah. If it goes this way, you know, towards the slope, this might be an opportunity where you could put like a swale along the top of the slope here and catch all of that water and then populate the area below the swale with plantings. It could be grasses or it could be flowers or it could be, you know, drought tolerant shrubs or trees. So that's like the you know basic simplest thing. Um, you know, I was looking at your gray water use and your washing machine with your four loads and your top load washer is producing about a hundred gallons. So you have three to five fruit trees. Um, I'm gonna just look at how long or sorry, how um, far maybe this is. I'm just gonna go from here down to here. And it looks like I'm going. 220 feet, so that's a lot. That might be a lot more than I would prefer to send it out, except that we do have the slope. So, right. and it's very steep, and our fruit trees are at that level where you did your measurement, but our property uh, goes much further down, also very steep. So, mm -hmm. we were thinking about maybe doing, um, now, now even this seems inadequate, but a 500 or 1,000 gallon mm -hmm. water tank down on, the terrace level where the fruit trees are, I'm sorry, that's why I call it the terrace slope down the first part of the slope, um, because then we can use gravity to get it down there. Okay, so let's think about this. You're producing 100 gallons a week from your washing machine. So 100 times 52 is 5,200 gallons from your washing machine. A thousand gallon rainwater tank installation might cost something like $1,600. A laundry to landscape installation for you might cost about that too, except a thousand gallon tank will only last you, I'm going to divide that by four, 20, um, my brain just, I lost it, four, um, 25 weeks or half, you know, half, is that right? Half the year? Um, it's half a year, yeah. yeah. So, um, whereas your, your laundry gray water system will water those trees all year round, and so maybe you could get another four trees, you know, for the same price, essentially. Um, and, could and you, I'm sorry, Brooke, could you repeat your last sentence? Because you kind of warbled out for a second there. Just that you could, um, basically for the same price, you could get, you know, five times the amount of water and, you know, plant more trees, essentially. Yeah. Um, now, another thing that I saw was that you have um, your two showers at about 15 minutes a day. So I'm just going to run through this really fast. I did this all before and so I wouldn't get tripped up. Um, so that's like 60 gallons a day, which is about 420 gallons a week. Um, now, if you switch your shower head to a 1.5 gallon per minute shower head, and there's a company called Think Evolve, Think Evolve, that produces a really good one. Some of them are kind of crappy, but 
just for the sake of argument, we'll just say you switch to a 1.5 gallon per minute shower head. Now you're producing 45 gallons a day with the same amount of showering, which adds up to 315 gallons a week. Um, so essentially you're saving 105 gallons a week, which is about how much laundry you're doing, um, which adds up to about 5,400 gallons per year. Now you've only invested $35 you know, and you're saving the same amount of water as you would by investing 1600 in a laundry gray water system. Um, and you're saving five times more than you would from catching a thousand gallons of rainwater in a tank. Hmm. So I just, I think those are important. Like that's like an elemental, um, important way of looking at all of this to really understand what makes sense for you in your situation you know and and sometimes all of it makes sense if you had a little veggie bed i would say go ahead and get that thousand gallon rainwater tank and water those veggies you know to your heart's delight mostly i would say let's find all of your downspouts and route them into your landscape and create a native paradise you know Put, put some nice pathways around your backyard that lead you through like butterfly um, and pollinator habitat that all is watered from collecting the water off your roof into these areas. Um, so I think, I mean, that's, that's the gist of it. Um, I'm gonna go back to my resource page. Um, Unless anybody has any questions about this. Well, I have just, I don't know if it's a question, but yeah, it's a question. Um, one of the things in addition to watering our fruit trees, one of the things we've talked about doing, again, our, the slope continues, our property continues down quite a bit further than what is currently on the screen. And right now, you know, whatever grows there is whatever grows naturally. But we always worry very much about fire abatement um, being in Lakeside, of course. Uh, and we'd like to, it's funny, it looks so green now, it's not generally that green. Um, mm -hmm. And we talk about maybe planting some kind of ground cover or just something um, for fire abatement down, even where you see those rocks sloping down. It goes all the way, goes a lot further down that. And it's all just really steep. You know, we don't even go down there other than to cut the shrubs back once a year. So if we could get something planted that would be like an ice plant or, or just something, um, something, some kind of ground cover that will help us with fire abatement, then how much water would we need or could we even generate enough from if we routed all of our downspouts, you know, put up more downspouts on a roof, routed them all down to that terrace level to a tank, you know, could we conceivably use water to get something on for ground cover down there without having to use irrigation water. Okay, this is a great topic. Um, I'm not sure how, I know we're getting close to the end here, but no, that, no, it's fine. So I'm gonna tell you a couple things. Um, first of all, to my understanding, ice plant is not a good ground cover for fire abatement because mm -hmm. even though it is seems like um, a wet thing, all the die off underneath is very, very dry and it just piles off up all that dry off. Um, That's true. Um, you know, I would, I, I mean, it looks like there's a lot going on down here. I would say like renaming it. Um, rena I just made that word up actually. Oh. <laughs> Living, um, putting native plants down there. Um, but I'm not an expert on plants, so I, I can't tell you a lot about plants, but what I can tell you about for sure is that if you start using the water at the top, so get those downspouts into your landscape, plant a beautiful landscape around your yard, what happens is all of that collect, and you, and you get your gray water going down to the fruit trees, and you're distributing the water along the, the slope, you know, along the contour of the slope, per, you know, perpendicular to the slope. It's, it's soaking in and it's moving downhill, but underground. So it's not a surface flow, but it is, unless it hits like a, a piece of geography that knocks it one way or another, it's moving downhill as a lens of moisture. 
and it's passing all the roots of everything that's down there. So getting things that are deep rooted, getting things that are native. If you go into the, I mean, even in this area, if you like a couple of weeks after it rains, if you go down there, you'll see little moisture patterns popping up. And that's water that's still moving through slope. And so you're, you're gonna create the most benefit for yourself by starting at the top, which is another of Brad's principles, getting that water soaking in, and then you'll get more uses out of it. You'll get the natives, you'll get the fruit trees, you know, you'll be able to populate things all the way down and there will still be enough water for the ecology down below because it's still, it is a large area and it's getting its own water besides what's coming off of the river. So um, I think that's like a, a really important element of water harvesting that people don't understand. You don't want to create surface flow, you want to create underground flow and whatever you water at the top, it, that water will move down um, that subsurface. You, you won't see it. It's like um, one of my other gurus, Art, Art Ludwig, um, he talks about water vision. And I just love it because we'll take like nature walks and there will be springs or, or you know, plants or whatever. And he really gets you to tune into those cues. It's like you're sleuthing, you're an investigator, you know, and you're kind of noticing patterns and things that are showing you where water is underground. Um, and that's, it's actually a, like a good practice um, to just understand. So some of those books, I'm gonna um, go back to the resource page um, so that you guys can write those down. I'm gonna switch really quick to the next page and then I'll go back. Um, this is me, uh, H2Ohm and Catching H2O. Um, I started my business like 12 years ago, and then I joined recently with another woman, Rosalind Hasselbeck, who's also been doing this uh, for 12 years. So now we're catching H2O, but we still have both. Um, I'm, I do a lot of the education as well as installation, and Rosalind works on some amazing projects like the, we installed the first gray water system to indoor toilet flushing permitted uh, this year. This is, you know, really, um, pushing boundaries in San Diego. Um, she works a lot more with pumps and stuff. Um, I created a water harvesting certificate course last year. We had 14 people, which was about as much as I could take um, through the San Diego Sustainable Living Institute. And it was awesome. It was about four weekend, long weekends in a month of installation, installation, installation. We got to get our hands on everything from laundry gray water to crawling under a house doing a shower installation to harvesting water off of streets and creating beautiful landscapes. Um, so we, we're trying to create like uh, new, new jobs, green jobs, and also just transitioning from, um, you know, kind of the old ways of landscaping to this kind of new way of, of using on-site water. So we also do lots of, um, in another time when there's not COVID-19, maybe in, I don't know, half a year or something, um, we do monthly workshops, laundry to landscape, installations, hands-on, you know, from start to finish, and you can learn to do it yourself. Bring a friend who has complementary skills, um, and then you guys can go and do each other's um, systems. So those are some resources. Um, we do consultations and installation. Um, I think one of you is slated to win a phone call consult after this. Um, and these are some uh, some great books and websites that um, you can rely on. Brad Lancaster's book, unfortunately, is not up here, but his website is harvestingrainwater.com, and you can find his books there. They're updated versions, and they're all in color. Um, so you guys, why don't I email this all out to everybody, too, so you don't have to write so feverishly at the end of this really good presentation. And then Brooke, I did have, there were two questions, a few questions that came in um, just back on rainwater. And this was from Angie, just wondering how long can you store rainwater? Yeah, uh, in your rain barrels, you're technically not supposed to store that for more than like seven to 14 days, but they don't really tell you that when they give you free rain barrels or tell you you're getting a great deal on a rain barrel. Um, and so the water tends to store a lot of bacteria and go anaerobic because it has like all that from your 
roof, like bird poop and dust and pollen, it's all getting in there and um, just creating a great environment for bacteria. So when we, we install tanks with filters, a leaf filter to keep out the large debris and a first flush debris um, or sediment filter to keep out um, the smaller debris, the water in the tanks stays really clean. And I mean, I've gone to sites where for some reason people aren't really using their rainwater that much. And so it's been in there for like a year or, you know, you know, more and the water comes out really, really clean and beautiful. So you can store that water as long as you want. Some things you might notice is a tinge of green, uh, which isn't bad. Um, algae is not, a small amount of algae is not bad. Um, but what they, they recommend, and they've done lots of testing on all of this in, in Australia, what they recommend is that just to avoid any, First of all, the E. coli with these kinds of filters is very, very low. It's like lower than um, the requirements for municipal water um, in general. But to avoid any kind of bacteria contamination, they just recommend watering the soil of the plants with rainwater instead of the, on the plants, the surface of the plants. So then, you know, uh, you can keep it for, you know, years. And then also I'm going to ask one more question. This one comes from Rebecca and Rebecca maybe chime in if, if I'm not getting this right. But while I'm doing this, before Brooke heads out, can you all put in the chat your feedback yes, from so today's I, workshop? Um, let us know how it went for you, oh, if it was oh. useful. Okay, so go ahead and put that in the chat. But um, the question from the Kurtz household was, do you replace the plumbing pipes, plumbing pipes or add components to the existing system? The water system, the reason why it does not require a permit is because if you do the laundry to landscape gray water, you are not altering the plum existing plumbing of the house. So you're strictly putting in a new pipe outside and a switch to switch from between the drain existing have shields? and outside. Um, I have to take another shield. Somebody, it's not muted. Um, if oh, no, you are fine. doing a shower gray water system, you're not necessarily replacing the pipes, but you are um, putting a valve in under the trap and rerouting the water outside. But you still need to make the connection back to the sewer. So it just depends. Every house is different, um, but you, you're you altering the existing system, but not necessarily replacing it. Like, for example, I, I will say this because I think people get confused about what gray water plumbing under a house means. In a new construction, if you knew you wanted gray water, you could put a whole parallel line from all the sinks, um, except for the kitchen sink and all the showers and the laundry outside. So you can have a main sewer line that's three inches or, you know, three inches. And then you can have a parallel line that's also three inches that's only gray water and put the switch outside and that way it could all go back into the sewer or it could all go outside. That would be a parallel plumbing but mostly we just do um, fixture by fixture um, and, and just capture a fixture and send that water outside. Does that answer your question? I think um from the Kurtz household, I think they were trying to unmute, but the connection is not the best. So if you guys, oh, we got a yes reply in the chat that that helped. Great. Um, Brooke, can I share our, can I share a screen of our website? Sure. And while you're doing that, um, I guess I'll just stop share. I'm going to answer a question here by, um, uh, how hard is it to direct gray water from a washing machine to a drip system? Okay, so that's an important question. And the answer is that you don't, you're generally not putting the gray water into a drip system. You're letting it flood out because there is particulate matter um, and you don't want to clog the drip system. So if you need to put it into a drip system, what you're essentially going to need to do is get a surge tank um, and a pump and have a, like a, a more involved filter. So a simple filter might be a pump that sends it out to a flood irrigation system, but a filter for a um, drip system is something that you would probably need to clean you know, every four weeks or something. So it's a lot more maintenance. 
Um, and then you need to do periodic flushing of the lines with, you know, a pure water source like rainwater or city water. So, um, you know, I, I, how hard is it? It's all relative. Um, it's definitely a more expensive system. It's, you know, the difference between spending, I don't know, maybe $1,500, $2,000 on a shower gray, passive shower gray water system to something more like $3,500, you know, and then having a monthly maintenance instead of zero maintenance. Um, I see a question from Michelle about, um, hi Michelle, um, municipal, there's a lot of cool stuff going on in like Portland and Seattle and Tucson. Tucson has a watershed management group and they are just rocking it down there. So there's a lot of municipal energy around cisterns and gray water in both uh, Tucson and Portland. Those are my kind of the things I know about. Cool, so I just pulled up the gardens website. We have consultations available. And this one right here is the water harvesting that we're doing with Brooke. And you can schedule it through the website. We're also going to be selecting a winner from this workshop. But here's what I'm going to do, you guys. I'm going to give you till the end of the day today to finish the survey. Um, it was sent out in the registration link. I'll go ahead uh, and put it in the chat box again too, but you have until the end of the day to finish your survey. So if you attended the class and you finished your survey, you qualify to win a water harvesting consultation um, with Brooke. Otherwise, please go ahead and schedule it for yourself. And um, we have a garden member rate, which is 70 and the non-member rate is 85. And it'll take place on like FaceTime or on a phone call. And you can see just from spending this hour with Brooke how valuable it is to get some personalized information there. Um, also, we have uh, water harvesting in your life programs that are going to continue on in the coming months. Actually, on July 23rd, we just uh, snagged that date with Brooke, so she's going to do a follow-up talk to this one. Uh, still kind of deciding what the theme, what the focus is going to be for that one. But if you go on to thegarden.org, uh, you can see this water harvesting page here. And you can also take a listen to a really great podcast episode that features uh, Brooke, and it's with Greeny Guide. And Greeny Guide host Pia Piscatelli actually attended this workshop, so she's here today. So you can take a listen to this. Uh, it's a really interesting story. We're, it's sort of like the modern day relevancy of water harvesting, and it's, it's uh, something that you can listen to while you're gardening. Um, I'm gonna ask if you have filled out that survey to stay on after this call because I just have a few questions. Some of them didn't come in with an email address. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that's it, but uh, Brooke, thank you so much. I got a lot out of this. I'm seeing in the, in the discussion board that it was motivating. And I think that is like a key word for today and for this group too. Excellent. I mean, the, the real, key to all of this is if, if all of us do it, that's when the, in, the big impact happens. And, you know, I, when I first started getting into this, you know, I, I would feel a little helpless. It's like one person at a time, like one house at a time, or just me. It's like, what difference does it make? It doesn't, it's not really, um, you know, it's not, it doesn't feel like it's making a difference, but the more I do and the more I, I learn about water issues and the more I talk to people that are dealing with water issues, the more, the more empowered I feel talking to you guys and knowing that you're going to go out and do something. And that's, you know, it's all going to start to add up and make a really big difference. Thank you. Honored to have you keep doing what you do. Um, Brooke will be back on July 23rd, and thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.